In the classic movie, E.T., there is a moment after E.T. has been discovered by Elliot, the main character, the child who has discovered him, the young boy, and eventually he is kept and the, his, Elliot's older brother and sister discover that this extraterrestrial is with them. And as they are trying to protect him and get him home, at one point, the older brother says to Elliot, he says, can he just beam up and go? And Elliot looks at him in all seriousness and said, no, he can't. This is reality. This morning in Scripture and in the Christian faith, it is a faith, as most faith systems are, of high ideals, of love, of mercy, of caring for one's neighbor. They are goals and ideals that are worthy and are a blessing to others and are in that abstract attractive to other people. But as Eliot says, this is reality. All the wonderful things that we would think about Christianity sadly lack in practice. In fact, in a song that Joni Mitchell put together some years ago, called The Priest. She sings a song about meeting a priest in an airport bar, and at one of the lyrics go, and he splashed his contradictions out upon my brow, acknowledging that on the one hand, the priest would say high and lofty things, but the reality may be very different. And indeed, if we're honest with ourselves, that reality is pretty stark. In fact, as we are struggling now, we know the reality of life and the reality of how one should be treated, regardless of race, is right at the forefront of our discussions these days. But even more so than that, the reality of ourselves. This morning in the book of Romans, in a passage that we have used before in our Lenten services here at St. Martin's, Paul does one of the great therefore or since he has to the world proclaimed in terms of Rome, where he knows he has to be on his best, not only his best behavior, but his best language, what it is to be a believer, what it is to be a Christian. And he has gone on to deal with the reality of both those from the old faith, the Jewish faith, and Gentiles, and the futility of their ableness to actually perform that which they say is the greatest tenets or how they should live their lives, whether it is explicit as it is with the old faith, or implicit as it is with the Gentiles. In other words, what is in their hearts and minds. And so he develops the sense that God does not accept us by those actions, that we have obviously failed. And he uses the great Old Testament example of Abraham's faith, as the linchpin to what it is to be a believer in God. And after, through that masterful argument about Abraham, he comes to this passage. Since we are justified, just as if we hadn't sinned, just as if we had missed the mark, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on to the wonderful things that in, entails, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. For Paul, up until the time in his life of the Damascus Road, he understood something that is very human about us, but indeed very frustrating about us. 
that religion was there to appease God or we would do what is necessary to make ourselves acceptable to God. But the frustration for Paul, as anyone else, was failure always seemed to be lurking around the corner. That he could never live up to those ideals. And indeed, if you think about his encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, that moment when, as the old candid camera thing said, when it's least expected, that light shines on Paul and he sees it all. And what is the beautiful thing that Jesus says to him? Did he say, you've been a rotten persecutor of the faith, you don't deserve anything? He says, get up. I'm going to use you. In his language to Jesus on the to Paul on the Damascus road, there is acceptance of who Paul is, even in the midst of his own sense of persecution of the new faith. And indeed, for Paul, this was a revelation. And he tells about how he tried to do, in other words, religion as a part of doing something, of having this transaction to make God like him or to be acceptable to God was completely thrown out the window. His relationship to God was 24-7 based on faith, based on Christ. And that was Paul's great assurance something he never had before. And so he knew that he could live his life with a foundation he never had before, an assurance he never had before. And so, really radically, he says in passages this morning, we boast in the hope of sharing the glory of God, but we also boast in our sufferings. Does this make Paul someone who likes to suffer? No, but he sees that through life the constant of the love of God in Christ does not leave us in our sufferings, in the reality of our lives. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And the reality piece of this and the wonderful piece of this is that last part of this passage. What is God's love for us? What does God really think of us, you and I? For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. And that wonderful verse 8, but God proves his love for us that while we were still sinners, while we were missing the mark, while we didn't get it right, Christ died for us. Someone has mentioned that and spoke about that sense of God in Christ in this way. A man by the name of Brennan Manning wrote, if Jesus would appear at your dining table tonight with the knowledge of everything you are and are not, the total comprehension of your life story and every skeleton hidden in your closet, if he laid out the real state of your present discipleship with the hidden agenda, the mixed motives, and the dark desires buried in your psyche, you would feel his acceptance and forgiveness. I believe one of the great difficulties in the church over the years, and perhaps it is one of the hardest, is that while we acknowledge the brokenness of humankind, we have dwelt on that too long and too hard. We have taken in the church because of what we think God doesn't accept and pointed out people as unacceptable. That there have been people over the years 
who see their sin rather than seeing the grace because we have had categories of people over the years who are, are sinners in God's eyes. But the truth is, if we understand the scripture this morning and even go back to the book of Genesis, we are God's treasured possession in Christ. We belong to God purely because we individuals, each one of us, are beloved of God. Henry Nouwen, in the book Discernment that we are reading in our book group, mentions that. And while indeed, yes, we need to turn towards God, and yes, there are things in our lives that we know that perhaps are not, not the best in God's sight, we have someone who accepts us, who is willing to listen to us. We don't have to go through a routine. He loves us just as we are. And while he wants us to grow, he never wants us to forget that indeed he loves us and how much so, as Paul says, he didn't just love us on the days we were good, on the days maybe we got angry at our friend or someone we care about. He loved us. On the day we perhaps did something that was out of character for us, God loved us. And that is powerful. It is real. And that is where the peace comes from. It is not in ourselves, but by the one we walk with who keeps us on firm ground even in the midst of our own contradictions sometimes. And we can depend on that God. There was a doping scandal some years ago and someone who was part of it speaks of how that works out. And involved in this doping scandal for the Tour of de, de France, person talked about the fact that he leaned on his mother for support. He said, she's the one that no matter what happens to me or anyone else in life, she will remain unchanged. He said, when, he spoke to me, when she spoke to me, she said, look, tell me the truth. Doesn't matter to me what it is. I'll see you the same regardless. And I think if you saw any of her interviews on television, she believes in me. As he speaks of her unconditional love for him. That is God's unconditional love for us. And it sounds so simple and so basic. But it is perhaps one of the hardest to accept. One of the situations I ran into in ministry some years ago was a person I knew who was very devoted to the faith and very involved in the church. And they had a very, very bad moral failing. And they came to me to talk about it. And one of the hardest things to bring forth, because they knew it was wrong, and I knew that person wouldn't do it again, they could not get over the fact that God forgave them. It was the hardest thing. These words that come from your mouth, that God loves you, and we sing the old song, Jesus loves me. In reality, that perhaps is one of the hardest things to grasp and to know each and every day that you are loved of God that you are the beloved of God. And Paul tells us, while we were yet missing the mark, Christ died for us. This is the gift of our faith. And in these days, perhaps, it is that sense of God's acceptance of us all. God's love for us all through Jesus Christ, perhaps, that we need to embrace as we deal with situations around us, 
and as we go forward. Because these are difficult times. On a secular note, in that way, perhaps it was expressed this way. Kofi Annan, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations in the early part of this century, in a seminar that I went to, spoke about the fact that before he became Secretary General, he worked with nations that were at war with each other. So he might help broker a peace treaty. And he said, one of the things that I had to do all the time, no matter how terrible one side was, was not to refer to them as the enemy or evil. He said, for if I did that, the talks would completely break down. Friends, we have a gift as Christians this day that God trusts us and loves us. I think as a side note this morning in our gospel lesson, Jesus knew how fumbling his poor disciples were. And it is even before the day of Pentecost, you hear in the gospel lesson this morning, the great responsibility he gives them because he loves them, he trusts them. He loves them and lets them go forth. You are God's beloved this morning. We are God's children. And God expects us to be those who share that good news and that love of God and neighbor. But that does not discount us. Nothing cuts us off from God's love of who we are. The peace of God is found for each one of us as we walk through life. Because, as Paul tells us so wonderfully, while we were yet in a place where we were missing the mark, not in our best place, Christ died for us. May you know that love. May you know that peace and that empowerment of what that brings for your life this day. Amen. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you for the reality of what your peace means. We thank you, Lord, that you do not expect us to try to make ourselves acceptable to you. We don't have to. You have accepted us. Your love, your death and resurrection for all tells us of your acceptance of us. Lord, there are voices out there that will tell us especially when we've missed the mark, that we're, we're no good. Or that we're not, we can't get close to God. Lord, when those voices come, help us to drown them out. That Jesus died for us, all of us, because God thought all of us were worth it that his salvation, his love, was for all of us. That is the reality in which we live. So help us to go forward. Help us to be God's people. But help us to take comfort that God made sure that the great love and belovedness he places on us is always constant and always there. And help us never, never to give up as we too live in this world as God's children. Amen.